Thank you both Al and Mary Lynn for inviting me to come back uh, this year and thank you all for your participation. The topic of my presentation is safety of medical cannabis and, and as you can imagine that's a, a huge topic. Um, I hope that in the next 20 minutes or so I can break down an approach that we've taken uh, with government funding in, in Canada given that we have a program where Canadians can have access to cannabis as a federal program. Uh, and we can, f we can actually then have the, the possibility of studying them prospectively. Um, and so what I'm going to show you here are some unpublished results, the data working in their way through the publication process now. But it's important enough to try to present to you the results of one of the studies that we did. And also, at the end, to perhaps suggest uh, a way forward in this area that I think, given all of the excitement, given the, the movement that is happening here in the U.S., that perhaps there's an opportunity for more work to be done. So this is an accredited conference and as such I must disclose that I have received grants and honoraria from companies that produce and are investigating the work in cannabinoid compounds, uh, but I owe no financial interests in these companies uh, or, or stand to profit from any of these, uh, the work that I'm doing. So how do we measure the safety of cannabis? Well, the two classical approaches that are taken for mainly recreational use are case reports and what we call observational studies, cohort studies or case control studies. Uh, cannabis has the unique distinction, I think, of being the drug that's been studied the largest phase one clinical trials in history, uh, as so many healthy people have tried it and used it and continue to do so, that we have a fairly good understanding of what the broad healthy volunteer safety pattern is. Less well known is the safety when we get into clinical patients and a number of phase two type studies, Donald Abrams with his HIV work uh, and uh, Barth Wilsey and a study that in fact has now been uh, in press uh, for neuropathic pain where side effects are reported. But these tend to be short duration studies and the kinds of exposures that are given are not always the adverse events reported and detected in the usual way. So we're a bit limited in knowing much about safety from that perspective. Nobody has ever done a phase three clinical trial of herbal cannabis. So we don't have any data there. And phase four, which is really post-marketing, once a drug has made it into the market and is then being prescribed or used on a wide scale, becomes another possibility. And this is really the big opportunity for, for, for safety research because now you have thousands if not millions of people using a drug. And this is what happened with, Vi with uh, Vioxx being pulled off the market. Once it became widely used, people realized there were safety concerns. Um, but we have two phase four studies and one I'm going to present to you today. The other one was uh, Ethan Russo's study and I, I don't think he characterized it as phase four but really it was, which was his study of the Compassionate IND program here in the US where he found the f four of the Compassionate IND users and the, with the glaucoma, MS, nail patella syndrome and congenital collagenous exoxtosis. I think some of you are here today. And uh, the range of exposure from 11 to 38 years, or 28 years, and the average dose between seven and nine grams of cannabis per day. And he saw them and administered a range of tests to the patients and discovered that the major findings were two of the patients had obstructive lung disease, one had polycythemia, everything else was within normal limits. And overall, the feeling was that there weren't any major safety concerns among these four patients. Uh, the limitations, of course, there's no control group. There was no evidence that they had uh, any of these problems before they started on cannabis compared to after. So what, what was the cause of the relationship and so on. So in an attempt to do that, to resolve some of these issues, we set this study up. And it was funded by the Canadian government through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, a $1.7 million study to collect standardized safety data on the use of medical cannabis in chronic pain patients. It was a prospective starting in time and moving forward, a cohort study with one year of follow-up for patients. Uh, we recruited patients at seven clinics across Canada, and we ran the study for four years, from January to April 2004 to 2008. The patients who enrolled in the study were allowed access to the herbal cannabis provided by the Canadian government, which is 12% THC, and they were given as much as they needed to use the drug. They could use it in the way that they felt that they needed it and they were allowed, they picked it up from the study pharmacy and they used it in the way that they normally would. We included patients who had chronic pain, non-cancer pain for at least six months in whom conventional treatments had been considered and were felt to be inappropriate or inadequate and that cannabis was used as part of their pain management strategy. We excluded patients who were pregnant, breastfeeding, had a history of psychosis, had unstable ischemic heart disease or unstable cardiorespiratory um, disease. 
and we had a control population. So for every patient who was a cannabis user, we had a patient who was also seen at the same clinics with chronic pain. The only difference was that they didn't use cannabis as part of their medical treatment. And the, otherwise, the inclusion and exclusion criteria were exactly the same. And we measured their adverse event rates over one year of follow. Now you imagine if somebody says to you, I'm going to follow all of the adverse events that happened to you for one year, you're going to be collecting hundreds and thousands of data points. Every time you have a headache, a runny nose, uh, every time you develop a, 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 a whatever abnormal bowel movement, we have to know about it. So an enormous amount of data collection coming in. We had a, a rating of serious or non-serious adverse events, and then an adjudication committee that was independent of the study who would review the adverse event uh, profiles, and an independent safety monitoring committee. We also took the opportunity to measure neurocognitive testing in the patients at baseline and at the end of the year, pulmonary function testing, e ECGs in them at baseline. We did a range of blood tests and blood panels. Uh, and we conducted some of the standard tests for pain intensity using a visual analog scale from 0 to 10, quality of life scales, mood scales, and so on, to see whether those parameters would change over the one year. So what happened? We recruited 215 patients over the one year period and 216 controls. Uh, we had a 30% dropout rate in the cannabis group and a 16% dropout rate in the control group. That's not unusual for clinical trial research, by the way. So in total, we had 174 person years of exposure to cannabis and 204 person years of exposure. That means if we had one person that we followed up for 204 years, that's the volume of time that they were exposed to the drug. So of course, that's 215 people followed up over one year. So it's quite a lot. That's a very significant quantity. Usually for clinical trial uh, and for pharma companies, it's about 350 patient years of exposure that they would expect to have to submit. The median daily dose of cannabis used by the patients was 2 grams per day, with a range of 1.3 to 2.4. So half the patients were in that range. Uh, and about 11, 5% of the patients received more than 3 grams a day. So it was rare that we had patients using more than that. Over time, over the one year period, we noticed that there was actually a very slow and a significant increase in the dose that was being used. So at one month, the average was 2.35 and there was a slow increase. We think that this is due to the fact that the dropout rate occurred mostly here. So that would have adjusted for some of this. We don't think this is tolerance developing. A tolerance development would look very different. It's a very linear change, but the, the average dose at the end of 12 months was 2.83 grams per day. How did they use it? Only 28% smoked it as their only method of administration. About half, just over half used it by both smoking and oral. About 8% used it only using an oral route and 7 used an inhaled, which is more a vaporizer and oral technique. The big serious adverse event is deaths. We had two during the whole study. Both were in the control group. Uh, one was a suicide and one was a perioperative death. The serious adverse events, the hospitalizations, the death, there was no difference in serious adverse events over this one year of follow-up in the cases the cannabis users compared to the controls. These were the serious adverse events that we did see, abdominal pain, intestinal obstruction, uh, kidney stones, uh, knee repair, and back pain, which was felt to be serious enough to warrant hospitalization. And we had a slightly smaller number of some of those Many of these were not felt to be cannabis related. So that's where the difference occurs. For the adverse events, these are not the serious adverse events, these are all the others, uh, we did see a difference. And the cannabis using group had a higher rate of non serious adverse events, 4.62, compared to the control group, 2.85. This is an incidence rate. So per patient, so number of events per person year. So over, overall, we had a doubling of the rate of non serious adverse events. I won't try and explain the rest of this data because we're a bit stuck for time. It'll be in the final report. Interestingly, the higher the dose of cannabis that was used, the lower the rate of adverse events. <laughs> so before Robert Melamide gets very excited, um, <laughs> We think that this is probably because these were more experienced users. They were more likely to be the more experienced subjects. They didn't report as many adverse events. The, the, the relatively naive users who came in the study were using smaller amounts and were more quick to report their adverse events. So there was a certain amount of non-reporting of adverse events in the more experienced users compared to those who weren't. 
And looking at the severity of the adverse events, the vast majority were mild to moderate in intensity. Only eight events in the cannabis group were severe, and there were four severe events in the control group. This is the total number of events overall that were reported. The most common events, regardless of severity, regardless of causality, were headache. So this is the cannabis group, were headache, uh, nasopharyngitis, sort of runny nose, nausea, interestingly, because of course we know cannabinoids are anti-emetic, drowsiness and dizziness. Those were the major adverse events in the cannabis group, and they were actually the same major events that we saw most common in the control group, although slightly more frequent in, as you can see, a doubling of the numbers in many cases in the cannabis group. The severe adverse events are the ones that perhaps most physicians are concerned about. So which were the severe ones? There were eight, diverticulitis, uh, hematemesis, joint arthroplasty, mania, motor dysfunction, MS, and muscle spasms, and vomiting. Uh, the mania was felt by the physician, the physician and agreed by the adjudication that this may be probably, uh, sorry, certainly or very likely due to the cannabis itself. Hematemesis was thought possibly to be related and all the others were unlikely to be related to the study drug. When we looked at the non-serious adverse events that were either certainly or very likely to be related to the cannabis, this was the defining drowsiness, memory loss, cough, nausea, and dizziness were the major adverse events that were reported to be certainly or very likely used to medical cannabis in this population. So, we reported 40 serious adverse events from 28 subjects and 818 non-serious adverse events from our subjects using medical cannabis. Most were non-serious, mild or moderate, uh, and we did not see an increased rate of serious adverse events in this group compared to the controls. We did see the increase in non-serious, and we just published uh, last year a re review of pharmaceutical cannabinoids. And in fact, the rate of, of adverse events in the pharmaceutical population is exactly the same as those we saw for the uh, medical cannabis use in this study. So it's consistent with pharmaceutical uh, cannabinoids. Now what about all the other outcomes? And I'll go very quickly through this. But uh, so 78 of the cannabis groups, we had to stop doing it because it was very expensive and the, uh, the study funding was, was running out. Uh, so we only did 78 subjects at baseline and one year. Uh, there was no difference in any of the blood testing that we did over that one year period. Liver function, endocrine function, everything was exactly the same after one year. This was the pain intensity. Uh, and the patients you can see here in the dark blue line uh, at baseline had a pain intensity of on average between 5 and 6 out of 10. That fell significantly to the end of the study where it was just between 4, 4 and a half. The control group's pain remained the same. This was a significant difference. So they actually did show some improvement in pain over one year in the cannabis group. The other thing we looked at, we have looked at all the data, and I won't present it here, there isn't time, but we also looked at the other use of medications, and these were fairly ill people uh, who were also on, and you can see the control group, 66% were on opioids, 59% uh, were on antidepressants, and 55% anti were on anticonvulsants, which of course are used quite commonly in neuropathic pain. Uh, and there was a significant reduction in the amount of other drugs used, both at baseline by the cannabis group, and that didn't change over time. So this was a baseline data, and we didn't see any change in this over time. So they were already using less of their other pharmaceuticals compared to the uh, control group. So limitations of this, even though it's the largest of its kind ever conducted, it's still relatively small scale. Um, we could use larger samples. We had uh, quite a high dropout rate. It would be fascinating to see what happens over five years, 10 years, and so on. Um, the uh, selection bias, many of the people coming in were experienced users and may have underreported adverse events. We can't, we can't interpret this data for people who start cannabis for the first time. These were experienced users. Um, there's a certain element of observation bias. The more you look at patients and the more you phone them every month and say, did you have any adverse events this month, the more you'll get back. Uh, so there's a certain element of, by, by studying them closely, we pick up more adverse events than perhaps might be otherwise reported. And confounding by indication, these were people with multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, rheumatoid arthritis, severe neuropathic pain, and so they all have a severe illnesses and are likely to develop uh, adverse events because of their illness, so that may also push the numbers up. 
uh, and the control group was not matched in any way with the disease or by drugs, so there were, there were epidemiological limitations with the control group. But on average, the conclusion is that two grams of herbal cannabis per day, these patients had significant improvement in pain, mood, quality of life. I haven't showed you the data, but this is what we found, and physical, physical component of quality of life. Um, we did see effects on airway function, and I haven't shown you the data, but we did see some restrictions in airway flow rates. Um, but there was a significant confounding effect of tobacco, which we have to try and adjust for. Uh, but overall, the adverse events that we did find were similar in both magnitude and in characteristics to other pharmaceutical cannabinoid compounds. So where do we go from here? And I'd like to take this opportunity to perhaps make a recommendation to, to those of you. And let me just perhaps do a little bit of research of my own here. I'm going to ask you, how many of you in this audience are patients who use medical cannabis? Just please, please raise your hands. OK, so I would estimate at least half of the room, so maybe 100 people. How many of you have ever been in a formal clinical study of cannabis use for medical purposes? One. So 100 of you are currently using cannabis, and only one of you has been in a research study. How many of you would, part would consider participating in a clinical research project if you had the opportunity? Pretty much everybody. I think it's a shame that every day that goes by that patients are using medical cannabis under any context, but especially those where there's some regulation involved, that we aren't gaining information like this. We aren't learning anything from you. As scientists, as physicians, as policymakers, nobody's gaining anything by having patients who are currently using cannabis as medicine and not having some follow up to learn more about safety. It's one of the, and speaking to physicians as part of my nonprofit work, um, I do a lot of talks. And one of the major issues that physicians raise is well, I, whether it works or not, the patients will tell me if it's working, but I'm worried about the safety. I'm worried about their lungs. I'm worried about their brain. I'm worried about their endocrine system. And the only way we're going to do that and resolve it is by doing prospective follow up. And we have the, the patients are here. They're, if if, if we, every day that goes by, we're missing out on that information. I'd love to see an international consensus to forget state and provincial and national boundaries and have an international consensus on the kinds of follow-up that should be done in patients using medical, medical cannabis so that physicians who have patients in these drugs are able to be followed up in a prospective way. Here's a recommendation. Every year, they should have the following tests. And if that data were collected in about two or three years, we would have an incredible database of information. Uh, and so I suggest that some of the things, just knowing demographics, knowing the other diseases that patients have, looking at pulmonary function, looking at cognitive function, and looking at dose requirements would be a major, major step forward. Uh, what's assumed in all of this is that, that we know about the quality of the cannabis that's being used. We can only assign the adverse events to the drug if we know that it's not other contamination or other risks that a lot of people are worried about, um, but we have to have the quality controls on the substances that are being used so that we, we can determine whether that's the, uh, the cannabis or something else that's causing any issues. But we won't know. What are the risks? Risks are we find problems that we didn't know about because we weren't really looking carefully. Well, I think if we do that, we know more about it. Patients are better informed. We as physicians are better informed, and everybody's better informed. The other possibility is we don't find any problems which is probably likely given what we already know, but until we look carefully, we won't ever know, uh, in which case we're better off anyway. I, I don't think there's a risk to doing this. In Canada, we have huge numbers of patients who are an increasing number signing up for the Health Canada program, and uh, th this number of authorizations in the program is continuing to escalate at a logarithmic scale. Um, and so we have the potential in Canada to do this kind of work. I hope that uh, we can interest working with, with people here in the States and in Europe and other areas where there are huge efforts to make uh, medical cannabis programs regulated and, and uh, more official. Uh, and I really hope that we can, we can establish something. Um, I have to thank the people that did the work with me. It was a huge team of people. Uh, they were all incredible at helping with ga gather this data from pharmacists to nurses and the patients themselves. Uh, McGill Health Canada and my funding agencies who think that this work is valuable enough to keep uh, funding it. Um, my own nonprofit, the CCIC, who I work for, uh, doing a lot of work with education and uh, helping to support me in some of my work. And of course, my family and friends for making, uh, helping me keep it real. Thank you. Thank you.